So my name is Aviva Weinstein, and I am a current sophomore here at Brandeis. Um, and I'm also Hillel's social and cultural events <laughs> coordinator. Uh, we're so excited today to be hosting Rabbi Albert Axelrod and Professor Stephen Whitfield. Rabbi Al mentored and inspired thousands of students during his 34 years as Jewish chaplain and executive director of Brandeis Hillel from 1964 to 1999. He was known for his political activism surrounding the war in Vietnam and civil rights. Under his leadership, Brandeis became a civil, a center of activity in the Soviet Jewry movement. Rabbi Axelrod's writing can conveniently be found in his book, Meditations of a Maverick Rabbi, published in 1985. Professor Whitfield is the proud editor of that volume. Steve Whitfield is the Max Richter Professor of American Civilization Emeritus at Brandeis. He earned his PhD here in 1972 and is the author of eight books, including Learning on the Left, Political Profiles of Brandeis University. He's been a visiting professor at the Hebrew University, the Sorbonne, and University of Munich as well. Uh, so the way that we'll be doing this is that Rabbi Al and Professor Whitfield will be speaking for about 45 minutes. And then at around 1.45, we're gonna take questions for the last 15 minutes. So there's gonna be an opportunity at the end to ask some questions, but feel free throughout to ask questions in the chat. Um, that's how we're mainly gonna be doing this. And then I'll pick some of the questions at the end to ask. Um, also, I said this at the beginning, but please try to stay muted during the conversation. That'll be helpful for being able to hear everyone. Um, so without further ado, Rabbi Al and Professor Whitfield. Uh, thank you, thank you, Aviva. And Al, it's a pleasure to see you, a pleasure to be with you. I trust that you uh, share the thrill of what can be done through the, um, through the miracle of Zoom, where you can see uh, and listen to, and they can see you, of at this moment about 300 people have registered for this event, and it's uh, really quite extraordinary. And uh, the purpose is really to allow you to reminisce, to talk about the past, to explain to people uh, what you have done, who you are. And uh, we will, I think, deepen our own appreciation of why we have cherished you really uh, for so long in so many ways. I'd like to start by conveying an incident that um, some people may not have known about, that, it, that is one indication as to why you are so special. Because I believe you may be the only rabbi whose character, whose integrity has been certified by a national airline. And that is, uh, you were going on a speaking tour of Australia, you left, Logan Airport, you were on your way to Los Angeles before going on to Sydney, when you realized and Berta realized that you had left your passport behind. You got to Los Angeles, Qantas was reluctant to let you board uh, in the hope that um, the passport would arrive. It did not arrive in time. The representative at Los Angeles therefore had to send a telegram to allow you to land in Sydney without a passport. And I'm gonna quote the exact sentence from the Qantas representative in Los Angeles to Qantas Airlines in Sydney. The line was, and I quote, the bloke is kosher, end of quote. That- Right on the head. <laughs> that is Al. <laughs> Al, it's a delight really to be able to ask you some questions about your life and the past. The, the program is entitled, of course, From Brooklyn to Brandeis and After. So what I'd like to do is start by asking you, what is it that you brought with you through your life from Brooklyn? What was it that shaped you? What were the values, the ideals, the experiences uh, your family background that shaped your life. Well, Stephen, number one, the prime, not acquisition, but the prime part of my life 
that I brought with me from Brooklyn to Brandeis um, was my wife, Berta. Uh, we have now been married for 59 years. That's a lot of mileage. <laughs> and we have um, four amazing children whom you also know, and they love you. Um, one of them, our only son, used to make up words with you. Uh, you and David had your own vocabulary that you could speak publicly and to others, and they would have not, not a, a similarity, not a bit of knowledge or understanding as to what you were saying, because all of your words were concocted ex nihilo. And, um, but you and David uh, went anywhere in the world with your own vocabulary. Um, and yeah, David but Al, I, Al, I want you to get to your Brooklyn accent or your Brooklyn background. What is there about Brooklyn that you took with you? Well, the accent would probably be the first. And I'm very proud of being a Brooklyn boy uh, from the Sheeps at Bay, Brighton Beach, Manhattan Beach area. Um, and uh, when I met Berta, we were both uh, Columbia University students. Um, I was a junior at Columbia College and Berta went across the street because uh, she was a Boston girl, but she became a fresh person at Barnard College, um, a school for women only to this day. Um, but we met on Berta's first day. She was getting out of her parents' uh, automobile and there she was on the sidewalk of Broadway and 116th Street, uh, about to enter Barnard College. And uh, I was running orientation for new students at that, that year. And um, so I tried to become friends with all of them and offer help to all of them who were getting out of their parents' cars and help with their luggage and get them settled in their dormitory rooms uh, at Barnard although technically men were not allowed to enter women's rooms at Barnard College. But since I was uh, representing uh, orientation, uh, I drew a, a per permit. So I helped Berta settle into her room. I think it was at Brooks Hall and Brooks was her last name then, or maybe it was Hewitt Hall. Um, and we- yeah. Al, I hate to interrupt you. You're going ahead of the story. I'd love for you to talk about your family, your that is your parents. And then I'd love for you to talk about the remarkable Jewish institution that also shaped you, which was Yeshiva of Flatbush. So Fair don't enough. jump too far ahead. We have time. What about your parents? Okay. Well, um, my mom and dad only had only one child, and that was Albert S. Axelrad. And it was a very upsetting part of my life because I didn't want to be an only child. I wanted to have siblings and company. And so I used to plead with my parents to have more children. And they tolerated that for a, for a spell, but then they emphasized that biologically that was not possible and that I had to adjust to that and live with it. And uh, maybe one day I'll fall in love with a life partner who will be um, receptive to the idea of having multiple uh, children. And um, so that's what I did. I stopped bugging my parents to have more kids. And I got accustomed to the idea of being a one and only. Um, but it never sat well with me. And I was never content with that. I always wanted siblings. So I started bugging my parents again to, uh, uh, this time I bug, started bugging them to um, uh, adopt children and that would suit me fine. And they tolerated that for a short spell and then said, no, Albert, we can't afford uh, to adopt children. And again, you'll have to adjust to being an only child um, and try to fall in love with a partner who will be open to having a large family. So Berta and I talked about it and I, I just loved her so much from the get-go. She was, she became the love of my life and is still uh, to this day, the love of my life. Al, I wanna get from your flat to Flatbush. 
Ah, so tell us, tell us about Yeshiva of Flatbush. They are good, Stephen. <laughs> um, my parents wanted to, my parents were not Orthodox Jews. My father was a far leftist person, uh, socially and politically. Um, and he uh, joined organizations that were in tune with that leftist um, posture. Um, and I sympathized with that from the earliest of, of times and uh, have become a lefty rabbi and uh, I'm proud of that. Um, but um, they wanted me to go to a school that would also give me uh, a strong Jewish background, though they were not really practicing Jewish life from a tra tra traditional perspective. They wanted me to know a lot about um, uh, Jewish culture, Jewish religious life, and the Jewish faith. Um, and so um, they found this amazing yeshiva, um, a Jewish parochial school um, in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, the old building that I was in um, as a new student was located on East 10th Street at the corner of Avenue I. Um, uh, and um, I loved that yeshiva from the get-go. I made good friends, uh, wonderful friends, boys and girls. Flatbush was a co-ed yeshiva from day one. Um, and um, I became an athlete uh, at the yeshiva of Flatbush. I was on the uh, starting basketball team uh, when I was very young and I loved, uh, I loved playing basketball. Um, and my friends were also on the basketball team. Uh, there was a set of identical twins, Harvey and Jerry Claristenfeld, may they rest in peace. Um, and they were among my closest friends uh, and they were both on the basketball team and they were both good students. Um, I was a better student, but um, we became very good buddies. The Claristenfeld twins, identical twins, and you couldn't tell them apart. Uh, in the early days, I couldn't tell Harvey from Jerry or Jerry from Harvey. And they were not very orthodox, neither were their parents, um, but they went to a yeshiva in Borough Park called Eitz Chaim. That means tree of life. And uh, it was a good yeshiva, but only an elementary school. Um, and, um, and, and was yeshiva of Flatbush 12 years or how many years did you attend? I think it was actually 13 years, it was 13. One, one or the other. Um, I started really in kindergarten and then first grade uh, through high school. Um, the high school was brand new in my day. Um, so I went um, through elementary school, through uh, eighth grade and, um, and then came the high school. Um, so, I was in the third graduating class of the Yeshiva of Flatbush High School. And ultimately the high school moved to a new building at the corner of Avenue J and East 15th Street. Um, and it was a wonderful school. Both the elementary school and the high school were absolutely superb academically. And uh, I loved my years there. I loved the kids, my classmates. I loved the faculty. Um, even one particularly orthodox rabbi who um, used to slap me on the head, on the tippy top of my head, when he saw me outdoors without a kippah, that is without a yarmulke, he would slap me hard right on the top of my head and he would say to me, Avraham, my Hebrew name, Titztanen Barosh, you're gonna catch a cold in the head. And he was trying to protect me from catching a cold in my kepi, as he said. And Al, you're, you're revealing that the instruction, if I understand it correctly, the instruction was all in Hebrew? Yes, Hebrew was the language of instruction. Uh, most yeshivot uh, taught not in Hebrew, but uh, I think in Yiddish, because Hebrew was the holy language, a language in which the Bible originated. So it was not a language intended for um, secular purposes. Um, so most yeshivot taught in Hebrew, but Flatbush um, was, uh, uh, so most yeshivot taught in Yiddish, not Hebrew, 
but Flatbush taught in Hebrew. And so my Hebrew became as fluent with me as my English. And I love the Hebrew language and love it to this day. And I love reading in Hebrew, whether newspapers or classics. And I love speaking in Hebrew um, uh, with Israelis, but also with non-Israelis. Um, uh, so you, you never had any, any regret, of course, of not having a public school education, given the benefits that you derive from that yeshiva. No, I never regretted it. I always, I always had a, a, a love affair with the Hebrew, with Hebrew and with uh, the Yeshivat Flatbush. Um, yes. And I remember well all of my teachers, both in secular studies and in Hebrew, um, and including the rabbis among them and the uh, very orthodox among them, like the rabbi who used to slap me on the top of my kippi. Um, this seems to have been a very traumatic uh, experience, Al. But it wasn't. I mean, uh, I had. Al, did you did you uh, develop your vocational goal? Did you decide to become a rabbi when you were a teenager, or when did that happen? It was very early in my life, but I can't pinpoint the precise timing of it, Stephen. Um, I had a uh, my father was not a synagogue goer. So he, and I became a synagogue goer very early. On uh, Shabbat morning, I would walk from our home in Manhattan Beach, next to Sheepshead Bay, into Brighton Beach. And there I would catch a bus, no, a trolley, what we called trolleys in those days. Here in Boston, we call them streetcars. But I would catch the, the Coney Island Avenue trolley in Brighton Beach and take it all the way to Flatbush to the, to the yeshiva. I want to ask you, because of the, the far leftism of your father, which you've told me about, did he object when you wanted to become a rabbi? That was very interesting. He, um, he never objected, nor did he approve. Uh, my mother was very proud of me from the get-go about becoming a rabbi. And, um, but she, she did not come from a religious background. She came from a very secular ba background. She was born in Brooklyn and grew up in Brooklyn. So my father, was, both my parents, wanted me to get a, a good Jewish and Hebrew um, background. So they took me to the yeshiva of Flatbush, where we had an appointment with the founder and the, yeshiva, and the uh, uh, principal, whose name, may he rest in peace, was Joel Braverman. Mr. Braverman, we called him. And... He was a rough, tough guy. Um, he was a fluent Hebraist. Um, I don't think that he was a real scholar like, like others, but his Hebrew was fluent and he loved us kids, um, except he was also a disciplinarian and boy, was he tough. And um, he expressed his love for us by pinching our cheeks very hard. So my, chink, my chinks on both sides could be reddened for uh, a day or two from Mr. Braverman's pinches. But his pinches, he made it clear emphatically that they were pinches of love um, uh, on both sides. But when he was angry at us for something, like I'll tell you one story, Stephen, that- um, and, then, and then we have to move on to uh, how you became a rabbi. Oh, fair enough. So- um, uh, we had a basketball game in Manhattan at Ramaz, our arch rival yeshiva. And um, uh, I don't remember who won the game. Uh, they were very good and we were pretty good, um, but it was close. It was very, very close. Um, but uh, the game ended late and um, uh, we had to get home and we had homework to do. Um, so we went home. Uh, on, this, on the trolley, uh, the Coney Island Avenue trolley, and got home. And then um, we were close to Shabbat, um, the Sabbath, um, and we had a teacher who was our very favorite teacher. He was our French teacher. So he did not teach Jewish studies. He didn't know any Hebrew. Um, I think he knew Yiddish, but no Hebrew. 
and uh, his name was Oscar Rosenthal, and we adored him. Um, so we had him every day for French until he had a heart attack. And um, then we, had, we could only visit him in the hospital for a while and at his home. He lived in the Bronx. Um, and so uh, we had a, a, a game on a Saturday evening uh, at Ramaz. Um, and uh, we got there just as Shabbat was ending. So we got there, uh, it was already darkening out, and, um, and we got to Ramaz, um, and they were coming out of synagogue, um, uh, the Jews, especially the elderly, their parents, the parents of the students. And so when they looked at their watches, well, they didn't all wear watches, but when they became aware of the time, um, it was clear to them that in order to get there that early, um, we had to have traveled on Shabbat. We had to have somehow managed to get to Ramaz while Shabbat was still going on. And they reported that to Mr. Braverman. And he came storming, and I mean storming, into our classroom that Monday morning. And he said, I want, he, his English was accented, um, I want to see the basketball players. I want the twins. I want Howard Ryan, and I want the big guy, Albert Axelrad, who he always called Avraham, my Hebrew name. So he wanted us in the hallway, out of the class, and he started pinching our cheeks, but this time so hard that it was clearly not a pinch of affection. It was a pinch of anger. How dare you travel on Shabbat and let it be seen by the Ramaz parents that you traveled on Shabbat. And we told him that that was an oversight on our part. Um, we think it was a mistake in retrospect. And we apologize to him and to the yeshiva for embarrassing the yeshiva bufumbi in public. Um, and uh, he embraced us in the end and just said, um, don't you ever let that happen again. His English was heavily accented. And, and we adored him. Too, yes. but he really oh, was very, so scared of scared of him. Um, yeah, very good. But he did make him a promise, and and we did keep that promise, except yes. for one day. Okay, Al, I got Al, I'm sorry, I've got to jump ahead because of time. Here's now a. a, a You're missing a good anecdote. <laughs> Al, you when you decided to become a rabbi, I believe you had told me more than once that you never wanted to have a pulpit, you never wanted to be a congregational rabbi, yeah. always wanted to do Hillel. Yeah. You always wanted to do to, uh, the chaplaincy in, on a campus. How is it that you made that decision? Why did you decide to uh, chew the congregational route and go to the campus route? Well, growing up in Manhattan Beach, which is adjacent to Brighton Beach and to Sheepshead Bay, and then two communities away from Coney Island. And we were actually part of that island, Coney Island. Um, but um, uh, so um, my father emphasized throughout my boyhood that his political and social leftism. And it was clear that he wanted me to inherit uh, that leftist uh, stance, uh, which I did indeed inherit and proudly so. Um, but um, there was this um, incident that I was telling you about, about uh, the night game on a Saturday night at Ramaz and how we had to travel on Shabbat to get there in time uh, for our warm up and then for the game. Um, but I was always very proud of this leftist uh, element that my father embraced. Mother didn't, mother was, um, apolitical is what I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, proud of being a Brooklyn girl and, um, uh, and a family woman, um, but um, not political. Um, I think she used to vote on election day, but my father used to not only vote, but also campaign for certain candidates and um, uh, especially for one political party that was called in those days, the American Labor Party. Um, 
and they had a, a candidate for president. I think his name was Taylor. Um, and I remember him very well too. Um, but I was always proud of this leftist component that was a mega part of my father's identity. And he used to go to um, Peekskill, New York, to a barracks to work out uh, there with other uh, uh, leftist and communist soldiers. Um, and a couple of times he took me with him. And uh, I had a very interesting day and a, and a wonderful time being with my, my dad in Peekskill, New York at a base uh, with his lefty buddies. And, uh, and, and so it was, your, it was your father's politics that made you suspicious of what it would be like to serve a congregation? That was a mega part of it because he knew that I wanted to be a rabbi and um, he never did anything to discourage me, but he was clearly not as proud of it as my mother was. She made it very clear how proud it was that her boy chick was gonna become a rabbi. Um, and she knew that, they both knew from the get-go that I wanted to be a, a university rabbi, a Hillel rabbi, and not a pulpit rabbi. And um, the fact was that growing up in Manhattan Beach, there was no synagogue in Manhattan Beach, but there were synagogues in Sheepshead Bay on one side of Manhattan Beach, and more so in Brighton Beach um, on the other side of Manhattan Beach. And there was one synagogue in particular that was um, an Orthodox shul. It was called, it had a Hebrew name too, uh, but it escapes me because they rarely used it. They referred to themselves always as the Manhattan Beach Jewish Center. And that's where I became a bar mitzvah. And the rabbi was a man by the name of Morris Max Alava Shalom. So his last name was Max, which was my father's first name. Um, in Hebrew, my father was Meir, meaning one who gives off light, Meir. And, uh, uh, but his English name was Max, and he was always very proud of it. Um, and I always liked that name, um, but I loved his Hebrew name too, which was Meir, meaning one who gives off light. That's a beautiful name. Um, yes. So there was a rabbi in, in our synagogue, um, but my father never went to shul there, uh, but I did. And I would walk from uh, our home in Manhattan Beach on Langham Street. The, home, the, the streets in Manhattan Beach were all alphabetized. So the first one started with an A, Amherst, then Beaumont, then Coleridge, et cetera. And we were in the poorer area, the more modest area where the houses were much smaller and much closer to one another. And, um, uh, and Al, Al I'm, I'm looking at the time here. I hate to do this to you. We have to get to Brandeis. Well, I have to tell you about Brandeis. Rabbi Max first. How did you get, Al, how did you get to Brandeis in 1965? Brandeis was my dream job, the job of my fantasies. Um, I knew that, that I didn't want a pulpit. And the reason I didn't want a pulpit and my father supported that, and so did my mother, um, was that in their view, especially my father's, um, pulpit rabbis were um, much more conservative than uh, uh, university rabbis or hospital rabbis. Um, uh, so my father thought, and I think rightly so, that pulpit rabbis were somewhat afraid for their jobs and they were afraid to be identified as left lefties. Um, so the, there was a rabbi of the Manhattan Beach Jewish Center named Morris Max, and I adored him. And everybody loved him except for the right-wing people because Rabbi Max would speak from the heart and from the head, and he believed everything he said. And he didn't, uh, he didn't steer away from saying the most controversial things. He would redden in the face and pound the pulpit and say his piece, his, mm -hmm. what he was really thinking and believing. And um, so, so and you my really father loved him. And my, yeah. father, my father stood by him. But since my father hardly ever went to shul, he was never um, with Rabbi Max, close person to person. 
except yes. that he loved Rabbi Max and he respected Rabbi Max, and so, so did Al, I. Al, what you what appealed to you in the in the from the in the campus rabbinate as a Hillel chaplain was really the sense of autonomy. Is that that's right? That's exactly right. right on. And did, and did Brandeis? Did Brandeis allow you in the years you served from 1965 to 1999, did Brandeis give you that autonomy that you craved? Is that- From the get go until we parted company. I always enjoyed that at Brandeis, including from the first president who was the president who hired me. And that was Abe Sacker, uh, whom I always called Dr. Sacker at first until he finally said to me, as did the other great scholars um, whom I was calling Dr. Glatzer, Dr. Altman, you know, and who would, they would finally say to me, um, Albert, they had German accents, um, Albert, it is time you called me Nachum, or that was Glatzer. Um, Dr. Altman never told me to call him Alexander because I don't think anybody did. <laughs> I'm not even sure what his wife, Judith, uh, called him. But to us kids, he was always Dr. Altman or Professor Altman. And we adored him and respected him and even and loved him. But sure. we could never bring ourselves to call him anything but doctor or professor. Um, so, so the Brandeis job was a dream job, Al, because there were distinguished Judaic scholars on the faculty. And they were my idols. Sure. They were really as close as possible to being my idols. I mean, Glatzer and Altman were two of the great, greatest Jewish scholars the world over. And yes. in Germany, where they started, and then I think they both moved to England for a while. Uh, I know Dr. Glatzer did. I think Dr. Altman did too. Yes, uh, he did. Uh, and uh, we just uh, adored them. I mean, we had Dr. Altman. Uh, Art Green and I were in the same class uh, with Dr. Altman. It was a class in Hasidism, and um, it was such a sensational class that we all wanted it to continue. Dr. Altman had agreed to teach it for only one semester, and we wanted it to go on for a second semester. So in the class, they were all chicken to, to talk with Dr. Altman directly about continuing the course into a second semester. So they elected me unanimously to be their voice <laughs> and to make an appointment to see Dr. Rodman. Art, even Art Green didn't want to go with me to talk with Dr. Rodman. And Dr. Rodman was also his advisor um, for his thesis. But so I was elected and I couldn't squirm out of it. And I, I remember very being very nervous about meeting with Dr. Rodman and trying to convince him, or to con him, as we would have said, um, into staying with us a second semester. But I did it, and uh, he couldn't have been sweeter and nicer. He was an amazing, amazingly good-natured, kind-hearted soul, and um, you couldn't not love him. And the same with, with Nachum Glatzer, you couldn't not love him. Um, I can think of many others that you could uh, not love, but Altman and Glatzer, they were two of a kind, great scholars, the greatest of scholars, European trained and, um, and fluent in languages. Um, and uh, they loved us and we just adored them. So I made the appointment to talk with Dr. Glatzer in his study in uh, the building that was then called Golding. Golding, it was at the Center for Jewish Studies. And uh, he couldn't have been nicer to me or kinder, um, but I, and I'll never forget his words, never. They made such a dent and they entered my heart um, so thoroughly and deeply. Uh, he heard me out. I mean, he was the epitome of a gentleman, a real gentleman. Um, he wouldn't interrupt you. He wouldn't talk meanly to you. He wouldn't embarrass you in front of others. There were other Brandeis professors, including one in Jewish studies who will remain nameless, who would embarrass students and, uh, and humiliate them in front of the other students in, in a class. Uh, and a couple of times they were crying. They, they were made to cry 
by these professors who attack them for either a stupid question or not having done the reading um, for the next day and asking a stupid question. Um, but Dr. Altman was so kind to me and he heard me out and I gave him my, my whole spiel about how much the class unanimously wanted him to stay one more semester with us, that we loved the course and we loved his way of teaching. And um, uh, so he finally said to me, uh, when he had to go, he said to me, uh, Albert, I want you to know that um, I love this class and I love you students. Um, but um, the truth of the matter is that the material that I was teaching, he was teaching uh, the origin of Hasidism. And so he was te teaching about all the, the great Rebbe's um, and uh, how it was that Lubavitch got its start. Um, but he didn't seem to be a lover of Lubavitch, but he was a, a real fan of some of the, the other great Rabbonim who started the Hasidic movement. Um, like, um, well, there were an, a lot of rabbis that he really admired and mm -hmm. spoke, spoke of very fondly, warmly, and respectfully. But he said he became so attached to them, to these rabbis that he admired so much that um, uh, ending the class and him leaving us was hurtful to him. He, he knew he would miss us and he would miss teaching this material even though he was not a chassid himself. Um, right. Really, he, Dr. Glatzer was more leaning toward chassidism than Dr. Altman. Dr. Altman was the, the, the epitome of the great scholar, um, straight-laced, and um, he dressed impeccably. Well, so did Dr. Glatzer. Glatzer as um, well, yes. Both of them. But, they were both yes. the epitome of gentlemen. Yeah. Um, um, and Al, Al, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting a kind of stage hook here by Aviva, who really wants to give um, uh, some of your former students, some of your the wonderful people at Brandeis who you counseled. I see David Mueller's name on yes. the screen, uh, yeah. your so, left side yeah. chest. And okay. he just recently, within the last couple of weeks, sent me... Uh, the three books he's written, and he uh, dedicated them to me. And in the first book, and I'll show them to you before you leave. Okay. No, oh, you're not going to be here, but uh, I'll bring them to the screen to show you. It was a, okay. a book in memory of his his late father, to whom he was very attached. But he dedicated um, the book to me, and there was one chapter, chapter seven, where he wrote about his heroes on the faculty of Brandeis as a whole, and I was the first one. So uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, I'm gonna try to get to a few. Sorry also if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly. Okay, our first one is from Ron Cronish. Um, oh, Cronish. Says, Cronish, who says, Cronish. I was your Hillel president, and so was my daughter, Dahlia. What was it like to work with student leaders in Hillel? Oh, I was so blessed, that's the truth. I had the greatest kids imaginable. Um, and I, I can't really think of exceptions, but my Hillel presidents were superb. The first one that I had was a kid named Jonathan Molino. Stephen, you may remember him. Jonathan Molino, he was the son of a rabbi who was an outstanding rabbi, happened to be reform, but was a real scholar too, and was in... Um, Danbury, uh, what town? Danbury. Danbury. That's right. Whoever said Danbury got it right on on the Schnazola. Um, yeah, the Cr Rabbi Cronish, uh, Ron's father, was uh, a great rabbi in Danbury, Connecticut, and he was such a great rabbi that those of us who were in rabbinical school at the time, we would take off um, early on a Friday and head up to Danbury, where we could hear uh, Rabbi Cronish. Um, uh, his sermons were, were just dynamite and showed such learning. Um, Rabbi John Molino, his name was. Rabbi Jonathan Molino. Molino. He was my first Hillel president. That's right. 
and his vice president was Bobby Sunshine, who became a, a, an officer of uh, the presidents of the United States uh, in, in working on the budget. He was a budget officer. And uh, Judy Lasker was another student act, uh, leader in Hillel. Uh, one of the, she was outstanding. She was just a great kid and a great student. And uh, I, I was very, very um, positive about her and her leadership. And we became very friendly. And so, so too with all of, all of her friends. Um, yeah, they were- All right. A, a bunch okay. of great kids, unbelievable kids. David Soloff. Um, oh, I can't get over how fabulous they were. And Ronnie Cronish was fabulous. Um, and his sister was, she was a dynamite kid. She had a, a physical um, ailment um, that uh, limited her height severely, um, but it didn't eliminate her character or her guts. Um, she, was, she was a dynamite kid and I became very close to her and, um, and feel close with her to this day, um, but we rarely, if ever, see one another. Um, so she was very, very short. She came up a little higher than my knees, um, but in terms of character and learning, um, she was as dynamite as they come. And oh. um, I loved her and respected her enormously. And Beaver, uh, we, be, we have to get to other questions. Okay, and kept in touch with Sorry. her for a very long, for a very Sorry, long Al. time. I, I keep yeah. having to do the acts with you. I apologize, <laughs> but we've got timing problems. And I still hear yeah. from Ron Cronish. Yeah. Um, okay, Stephen, let's go ahead. Okay, okay. so we have a few questions um, asking you to talk about your experience with the civil rights um, activism that you did. Um, and also a little bit about anything you did with the Soviet Jewry. Um, if you could talk sort of, I know those are two separate things, but sort of about any of that activism. That but you they did. were my two nearest and dearest causes. They were the two causes that I felt mostly devoted to and not in any particular order. I was drawn to both causes, Soviet Jewry and civil rights. I guess civil rights I became involved in earlier um, because it was, the, uh, of all the causes available to us, that was one of the earliest and one of the uh, most important. Um, and uh, um, I remember early in my Brandeis days is when um, Reverend King was killed. Um, I think it was in Memphis, Stephen would know, yes. at the top of a yarmulke. Yes. It was in Memphis, yeah. And I remember that I was so moved by that man and by what he stood for and for the guts of that man um, and so upset with uh, the murderer who killed him in, in Memphis that um, the very next day after the killing, um, I was moved to um, go to uh, Memphis with a bunch of other clergy. There were about a dozen of us maybe a dozen, maybe 10. Um, to my regret and embarrassment, I was the only rabbi among them. Uh, so the others were all uh, Catholic priests and Protestant ministers. Um, and this one tall, bald rabbi. And I was very proud of, of being with them and of going with them to uh, Memphis. And there we met Coretta, uh, almost from when we stepped off the plane um, and we met Reverend Abernathy uh, also as we stepped off the plane um, and others of Reverend King's disciples and students and friends and colleagues. And uh, uh, one of them taught my wife and me, well, they taught me that day, uh, a, a Negro spiritual song that has stayed with me all through the years and that Berta uh, learned with me after I got back. Um, and Berta and I sing it together at, on different occasions. Um, so it's a beautiful uh, Negro spiritual, black spiritual for which there is a harmony. And uh, I love doing it with Berta. We've done it at different parties, different events. Um, um, would you like to hear a tiny bit of it? 
You don't. You can't. You don't have time. Okay, that's too bad, Berta. Al, Al, you were gonna you're gonna talk about Soviet Jewry. The other part of the Soviet. question. Geneva trans. So one one great cause was was the civil rights cause, and that uh, became uh, very very important to me. Um, I knew um, quite a few black people from Brooklyn, from my my Brooklyn days, <laughs> and. Um, um, well, anyway, uh, I better move along because um, Stephen doesn't look like a, um, a muscular guy who would uh, kick the you know what out of someone. But I fear him. I would not want to fight him with my fist. But, but um, what about Soviet yeah. jury? Oh, Soviet jury. How'd you get involved in Soviet jury? Yeah, that that was the other, the two causes that motivated me during my early days as a rabbi were uh, civil rights and Soviet Jewry. Um, I got to know, um, 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 oh God, Steve, that the couple, the husband and wife, and I think they both did time in jail. Um, what was their name? Bonner and Sharansky. That's it. Thank you. And I, <laughs> Avital. Yeah, and I, I think I knew Abital a little better than I knew um, him. And, uh, totally. and she was, I think, more liberal than he. In Israel, he became involved with some right-wing parties, peoples, and causes. Um, I think more than Abital did. Um, and those were causes that I did not identify with. I had a lot of Israeli friends and was involved in Israeli causes, and I'm proud of them. But um, uh, but I never felt close to the Israeli white right or the uh, the hawkish um, parties in Israel. Um, yeah, I just was never drawn to them. But I remember one day I was sitting in my study at Brandeis, and my study, as Stephen remembers was very small, very tiny, and very cluttered, extremely cluttered. And one day I was sitting in there with, with three or four kids. And so they were sitting on the floor, which was not uncommon. And I was sitting in my chair at the window, which had a beautiful view of downtown Boston. And um, uh, uh, but what I was heading toward was that um, I was... With I got a phone call in the middle of the conversation with the students. So they were on the floor. I was on my desk chair. And, I, and Ellie, my um, secretary and staff assistant of a zillion years, I think she was with me for about 35 to 40 years. And she became like a member of my family. And the students adored her. And so did I. And Berta, my wife, loved her. Um, Ellie Afienko. Um, and a class act, uh, a devout Catholic, but also a lover of Judaism. And at one point she said to me, um, she's never had a Hebrew name. How do I feel about recommending one to her? And so uh, the next day I came in and I recommended that Ellie consider the name Ilana because it sounds like Ellen and, um, uh, and it's a beautiful name and it has a beautiful meaning. I told her, as I understand the name Ilana, it comes from the word Ilan, um, which is a boy's name, um, but which also means a tree. It's not an ordinary word for a tree. The ordinary word is eights, as in bore pre ha eights. Um, but the uh, literary term for a tree is Ilan. And it's a beautiful word and a beautiful name. And she loved it immediately. So she took the name Ilana, not instead of Ellie or Ellen, but in addition. And um, so it was a, a very nice thing for Ellie and for me and the kids who, uh, who, got to, who were Hebraists also liked it very much. A few of them would call her Ilana from time to time. Um, but it was, a, it was a great name for Ellie Afienko. And she had a warm spot for Jews and Judaism and Jewish causes. Um, yeah, she really did. All right.
righty. Well, that was very great. We unfortunately have a ton more questions, but the time is up. Um, but we will have a recording available next week, um, and they'll also include all of that in them. I know some people asked about that. Um, we just want to say thank you for, to everyone for joining us today. Um, and also just mention an upcoming event that we have. Um, it's called A Celebration of 73 Years of Jewish Life at Brandeis. It's going to be happening next Sunday, March 7th. Um, and you can find the info to register in the chat. I think Celine put it in the chat. Um, so thank you, everyone. And this was really awesome. Sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but you're welcome to follow up afterwards as well.